I am here today with Dr. Clinton Arnold, and he is the president of Talbot Seminary, where I am attending right now. He's also a author of a commentary on Ephesians and several articles. So I reached out to him recently, now that we're all experts on Zoom, and asked him if he'd be willing to share a few minutes with me and tell us some insights about Ephesians, specifically as it relates to spiritual warfare and some of the background with magic in the book of Ephesians. So uh, Dr. Arnold, we're so grateful that you are here with us today and giving us some of your time to share. Would well, thanks for the invitation, Tim. I, 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 I love talking about Ephesians, so we, we can talk for three or four hours if you like. Okay, well, we're going to do that then. <laughs> let, me, let me start with the first question off the script. Uh, tell me, what is it, what got you into Ephesians initially? That's not on the script, but I'd oh, love yeah. to know. No, it's an interesting story. Well, I, uh, I, I became a Christian as a teenager and I uh, was led to the Lord by a graduate of Biola. That's where I'm teaching right now. Uh, Talbot School of Theology is the seminary for Biola. And uh, when I became a Christian as a teenager, the pastor told me, hey, you've, you, you've got to get into the word now. And I took him seriously at that and just got deeply into the word and never looked back. I just could never get enough. And especially trying to figure out what did the text mean back then and what did it mean to its original hearers and so eventually one thing led to another my wife thought she was marrying a farmer and i things changed after that and i grew up in the central valley of california in, a, in the agricultural area and i had a call to ministry and eventually went to into a phd program in scotland where I began with the general idea of, I was just praying, Lord, give me an edifying topic that I can really focus on in my doctoral research. And I focused on the power of God in the life of the believer. In other words, how can I change? How can I live differently? My family had been kind of messed up and I, you know, that kind of a question was deep on my mind. And so I focused on the power of God in Paul's letters, uh, in general, and in the process of that, came to realize that the Apostle Paul says a whole lot more about power in Ephesians than anywhere else in his letters, and the burning question was why? And part of the answer to that question came in the realization that this letter also speaks of the opposing sphere of power, principalities, powers, and authorities, but God's power is infinitely greater. Yeah, I always appreciated in Ephesians that opening prayer where he talks about the same power that God used to raise Christ Jesus from the dead lives within us, the church. I mean, that's an astounding concept. And I think that right now, especially in our cultural moment with COVID-19, with political unrest, with racial rioting going on, I think a lot of people feel powerless and they're grasping for power. And then if we look at our own lives and think of the things we haven't been able to change um, over the course of years, we, we are, we're earnestly seeking that kind of power, and it only comes from God. And so, so Ephesians is a great so picture of that. Yeah, and I just love the way Paul says it in Ephesians 6, 10 and following. He says, be strong in the Lord. Uh, it's so easy for us in a Western church to put a period after be strong. Hmm. Finally, just be strong. I, I was raised on a farm. I, I mean, I know what this is all about. You know, you, you just get out there and get the work done. You suck it up, be strong. But it says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And the secret is relational and tapping into that relationship that we can have and that we objectively have with the Lord Jesus Christ. We could go all sorts of places with this right now because I'm thinking of another place where Paul says, when I am weak, I am strong. There's this paradoxical understanding of, of strength from Paul and his relationship to Jesus. But, but that's in a different letter, and we're going to stay in Ephesians. So I, I do 
I do appreciate that that's what drew you there. And one of the things, just a brief commercial for Talbot, one of the things that drew me to Talbot for my DMN program was I love the spiritual formation focus that you have woven into all of your programs. And spiritual formation does a good job of saying, if I'm going to change, it's going to be because the power of the spirit changes me and I partner with the spirit rather than I just am strong, like a good American. I show my grit and make it happen. And so oh, there's, there's my commercial for you. <laughs> well, well, thank you. We take that very seriously. We, we don't want it just up here. We really want to see transformed affections, a transformed heart uh, that issues out in a transformed life. But it's got to start deep in who we are. And there's a lot that goes into the kind of people we are, a lot of hurts, a lot of pain, a lot of neat things that have happened, but understanding ourselves in relationship to God and then learning how to uh, tap into his power and into his spirit is really essential. Yeah. Well, you are farther along in this journey than I am. So I'm glad that you're willing to, to share some of these thoughts with me. Um, I'm always looking for advice and insights from, from older men and women in the Christian faith, uh, because I mean, we, we can learn from each other, but uh, there's always something to learn from someone who's walked a little bit longer in the journey. And so. Um, well, that's a, that's a real kind thing to say. I, I keep trying to convince my grandson that this is blonde hair and he keeps telling me it's gray. So I, I'm not, I haven't been successful successful yet. <laughs> well, you had mentioned something about Ephesians because you want to understand how it, how it is understood by the original author mm. or by the original audience. What did the original author mean? So why does Paul emphasize power to the Ephesians? Um, how do we know, I know in your commentary, you mentioned magic and being practiced in that area. How do we know that magic was a common spiritual practice in Ephesus? Yeah, very, very good question. It, it, all we have to do is open up our Bibles to Acts 19, where Luke tells the story of uh, the origin of the church at Ephesus. And Ephesus is in uh, what is today modern-day Turkey, the West Coast. And in the first century, Ephesus was the third largest city, not only in Asia Minor, but in the entire Roman Empire. It was a city that probably began at a quarter of a million people hmm. in population. Uh, but what Luke tells us, I mean, Paul spent more time in Ephesus than he spent anywhere else, uh, three full years of ministry there. So we, we get highlights of that ministry. And so we get the most important events probably uh, that happened uh, that Luke can tell us about. I'm sure he could have written an entire book. But what he chooses to tell us about is an event where uh, there were... Uh, these roaming Jewish exorcists, which seems kind of strange, they itinerant exorcists who were a Jewish background that were finding enough business to keep him plenty busy. And they had uh, added the name of Jesus to their repertoire of magical formula for dealing with demons. And we may wonder, well, how, how would a Jewish exorcist do it? They often invoked angels in, in these kinds of practices and had different kinds of spells and formula and rituals that they would use for this kind of thing. Uh, but they began hearing that the name of Jesus has great power associated with it. They added it to their formulas, and then they had an unfortunate encounter uh, with a very severely demonized man, and Luke kind of summarized this is the account is they fled the house naked and bleeding because this demonized man manifested and it took advantage of them. And uh, Sceva and his sons, uh, the exorcist, uh, left the house, it says, naked and bleeding. And right after that, it's very fascinating what Luke says. He said, they brought out the text. There was a great fear that came over the area. They brought out their texts their magical texts and burned them. And there was 50,000 days wages worth of magical texts that went up in flames. And that just shows the magnitude of how widely practiced this stuff was in Ephesus. And it's probably important to keep in mind that Luke says it was those who had believed that had brought out their texts. So in spite of the fact that they had made professions of faith in Christ and were growing and, 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 
involved in the church and in ministry, they were still practicing magic, which meant that they were trafficking in spirits hmm. and in and, and doing these kinds of uh, incantations and formulas and things like that. And it took a sovereign act of God to bring the conviction upon their souls. Hey, this is way out of sync with my Christian faith. And God used that event to uh, sovereignly move to uh, cause them to repent of that and burn these texts. And that's in the scripture itself, it tells us that. And these were the kinds of people who were becoming Christians, people who had this kind of background. But also the archeological evidence uh, points to these kinds of practices as well. The archaeological evidence and then the literary evidence of stories that were told about Ephesus talk about it being something of a center of magical practices in the Roman world. Now, this kind of thing was practiced everywhere, but there's a reputation associated with Ephesus and the practice of magic that kind of preceded it. I'm still stuck on this number. Did you say 50,000 days of wages? Yes. I mean, Luke says 50,000 drachma. A drachma was the equivalent of one, one day's wage of a hired uh, laborer at the time. So it would be the equivalent of, of that. So I suppose we could figure out a modern day equivalent by uh, figuring out uh, minimum wage and then uh, multiplying, you know, by the eight and then by 50,000 and come up with a, a figure. Well, I'll have the fact checker of this video put that number up for us uh, at some point. <laughs> uh, now, so what would motivate people to use magic? I mean, there's obviously power that's involved. Are there other motivations as well? Yeah, for us right now, it seems a bit odd. We often associate the word magic with somebody that we might invite to our kid's birthday party to do some <laughs> tricks. Um, but in, in the ancient world, magic, uh, an anthropologist might call it shamanism, but we call it uh, trafficking in spirits in the sense that people uh, back then, everyone believed in the reality of good and evil spirits. It would never have occurred to them to doubt that kind of thing. And so the issue was how do I live in light of the fact that there is this reality? So the question comes up, my 10-year-old daughter has a fever and it climbs to 104 degrees. What do I do? Uh, we naturally think we, we call the doctor, we take her to urgent care, we do something of that nature. Back then, there would have been an immediate assumption that there may have been uh, some kind of spiritual involvement in this uh, situation, that she may have come under a curse, there may have been an evil eye cast upon her, uh, any of a variety of different things, but they may go to a person that would be kind of a, a community, uh, in, in, in some circles they call them witch doctors, but uh, a magician or a shaman or some kind of person that knows spirits, has that kind of wisdom in dealing with spirits and can identify what is at the root of this horrible fever and then using the right kinds of incantations and spells, invoking the right spirits to uh, effect a curse, uh, to effect a healing from okay. the curse. So it's for physical protection for a loved one. Um, as, yeah, okay. So in some cultures, you might still see this too. Uh, you might hear about this in... Um, there are in some countries in Africa or some tribes in Africa, I think they still have like a medicine man. Um, yeah, exactly. There, there are spirit houses. I know we visited Cambodia one time and we also saw spirit houses, but that was more to keep bad spirits away. But it's still mm -hmm. that same sort of mentality that um, sickness and hardship come through bad spirits. And that would have been the same in the first century as well. They would have had different kinds of uh, formulas they would use, different spirits they would call upon to ward off the bad ones. So you call on these good ones to ward off those bad ones. Uh, spirits were also associated with the religions of that time as well. Uh, Luke tells us in the book of Acts that the most prominent deity worshipped in Ephesus was Artemis. 
also known by her Latin name as Diana. Uh, and uh, there was associated with that a lot of spirit activity with these pagan cults. In fact, uh, the Old Testament, one of the reasons for the concern about idolatry in the Old Testament is that it was animated by the demonic. Deuteronomy 13, 32, 16, and 17 talk about um, the gods of the nations and what the people are really worshiping and offering their sacrifices to are demons. I mean, Deuteronomy 32, 17 in the Torah it states that explicitly in a number of other passages in the Old Testament. So for a Jew coming into the city, uh, especially one now as a Christian, Paul, uh, and seeing all of the uh, gods and goddesses worship there and all of this activity, there would have been an assumption that there was a lot of spirit involvement in all of this uh, in the first century. And so in the, in the letter to the Ephesians, there is a way that Paul presents Jesus and there's a way that he presents the spirit that counters this. Can you give us um, just a picture of how he presents Jesus and the spirit? Uh, to the Ephesians in a way that might speak to that spiritual world? Yeah, I, I really think that that is a major theme in Ephesians, that when we read Ephesians, we should think about a people group who don't doubt the existence of this, but are living with it as a day-to-day -day reality. And now that they've made a profession of faith in Christ, what difference does it make to have a relationship with Christ? Are these things still real? Uh, should I respond differently to things like this now that I'm a Christian, they would be asking. And so uh, some of the observations we can make on the overall message of Ephesians with this question in mind is, first of all, Paul never casts doubt on the reality of this realm. Uh, he doesn't say, hey, you know, guys, once you grow a little further in your Christian life, you'll come to realize that this is uh, a dangerous superstition that you shouldn't believe in. No, he refers to the reality of these spirits uh, through the language of principalities, powers, authorities, uh, world rulers, and a variety of other terms uh, numerous times in the letter and tries to reshape their perspective on it. Number one, God is supreme. God is sovereign. Uh, the devil and his uh, host of spirits do not present a challenge to God. Mm -hmm. He will uh, unfold his plan. He will bring it to completion. And there's nothing that can stop it. He is completely sovereign and is high above this realm. The same can be said to be true of Christ. In fact, some of the most eloquent and moving descriptions of Christ are in Ephesians when it says that God raised him high above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and every name that can be named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Um, God placed everything under his feet and made him his head over the church. Uh, it's just beautiful, eloquent descriptions of who Jesus is in relationship to this the, to these powers to assure these new believers, hey, the person you are worshiping now, you can trust completely. Uh, and you do not need to fear this realm because by virtue of your relationship with Christ, uh, you have uh, a connection with someone that's far greater. And then perhaps the third thing that Paul does in the letter is he says now who we are in relationship to Christ. And so in Ephesians chapter 2, he talks about being co-resurrected, co-ascended, and co-seated with Christ at the right hand of God. All of that to display the fact that we're so closely, objectively tied to Christ in our union with him, that what is said of, to be of true of Christ is also true of us. I mean, we're not exactly living in heaven right now, but we're connected to Christ so deeply that we share in his power and authority over that realm. So he sets a framework for how to think about the evil spiritual realm and also how to respond to it. 
Yeah, those verbs that you trace throughout Ephesians that begin with soon and mm-hmm. com- whether they're combining us with Jesus or us with our fellow brother and sister in Christ, whether they're Jew or mm-hmm. Gentile, that's a profound idea. But even that phrase in Christ, some mm-hmm. variation of that shows up all the way. So that really speaks to that that deep communion that we have with Jesus that's so powerful. And so because he reigns, we get to live within his reign. And uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's a profound idea. I felt like you were preaching a sermon as you were sharing that. I was getting <laughs> riled up and excited. But it uh, is very exciting. And I, uh, it's hard to read Ephesians without uh, falling on our knees and worshiping as we read it because of the profound truths like this. Yeah. Now I need to take a bridge to modern day culture because we live in a scientific culture in the West and we have a scientific answer for everything. It's, it's all material. And so how do you see in our culture forms of maybe even still magic or superstition, uh, maybe even in American Christianity. So if I need to phrase that question again, what are some modern forms of magic or superstition you see in modern Christianity? Yeah, I might begin by saying that, um, you know, with 2,000 years since the first century, and uh, that's a lot of time to elapse, and Satan hasn't died and passed off the scene since then. So neither has the realm of demons, evil spirits, principalities, powers, and authorities. So how do they make their influence felt now, especially in a naturalistic, uh, materialistic worldview like ours, um, I think their mode of operation is different. Uh, But before I say that, I might say that some of the ways that they operate are still the same. Um, I've prayed with a number of people who have claimed to have supernatural Uh, kinds of experiences of being oppressed and afflicted by spirits. And if there's anyone who feels themselves under that kind of spiritual attack, and it's not simply neurological or psychological, that they feel something palpably spiritual, there is uh, reason for hope in Christ for him to bring freedom, release, deliverance, and redemption. And, and there's power in the gospel for that. But we live in a modern, scientific, naturalistic worldview, sort of an age where this is discounted. And one of the ways that Satan works, and Paul and the early church fathers talked about this, was that Satan was adept at planting thoughts in people's minds. I mean, we can come up with a lot of bad things thinking in and of ourselves without ever having to blame it on the devil. Uh, But one of the ways that he works is to inspire, to plant thoughts and, and give ideas of things that are counter to anything that God would want to do in a, a good and gracious and redemptive way. And when uh, a couple of people have the same thoughts and then it becomes a coordinated whole, it gives birth to uh, a system of thought, an ideology, Mm -hmm. uh, a framework of thinking, a culture, a uh, various kinds of isms that may afflict us. And so we might wonder some of the trends we see that seem ostensibly evil in our culture there may be the fingerprints of the devil on those sorts of things because he has the ability to deceive, to plant thoughts, and to coordinate. So we believe in intelligent design in the creation of the world. And on the other side of it, I think we can't underestimate uh, the importance of acknowledging that Satan is an intelligent being and that he will intelligently and creatively perpetuate evil and coordinate evil. 
And that doesn't mean that you need to rush in and do an exorcism. It means that there is a powerful supernatural influence that affects our society. And so trends that we see may have very demonic kinds of overtones to them. Yeah, it's such an interesting insight um, because I think an individual could say, you know, they might have uh, a, an accusation pop in their head and they could say, maybe the devil planted that, or they could have um, a, a lie pop in their head. They feel like there's an injustice where maybe there isn't an injustice and then five other people have that and then it creates a movement. And I'm not speaking to anything going on in culture sure. right now, but then you're saying that becomes an ideology or an ism. Mm -hmm. And if I were to stand up and say, you know, that movement seems demonic, people would view me as though I'm kind of crazy <laughs> mm -hmm. because we've discounted the devil in the way that he works. But what you're suggesting is that the devil is still deceiving, the, st the devil is still provoking, the devil is still accusing. And when he does that in a systematic way with groups of people, you find yourself looking at movements or institutions that may have a demonic force behind them. And that's very challenging to, it, it, the power of Jesus, you can challenge anything, but that's very challenging as an individual to, to face. So I, I like the way you framed that. Paul speaks to that uh, more explicitly, I think in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, when he talks about the weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of this world, but they're mighty for the destruction of strongholds. And then it talks about taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Uh, and I think again, looming in the background of this is there's a spiritual dynamic here. Um, and once again, we don't have to blame the devil on coming up with bad thoughts in and of themselves. I'm perfectly capable of coming up with bad thoughts, but he exploits that. He uses these kinds of things uh, to accomplish his own purposes in a coordinated way that becomes like you, like we've talked about it as an ism in our society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let me get to the last teaching of Ephesians chapter six before Paul closes out the letter. And you you opened with this. It's it's not just stand firm, but it's stand firm in the in the strength of the Lord. And then putting on the armor of God. Um, I'm just curious, how would you appropriate or how would you encourage people in the church to appropriate the armor of God today? And to, and maybe there's a clue in Ephesians four twenty four, maybe not. But how would you appropriate the armor of God today? Yeah, great question. Um, what, a, what an amazing passage that is. Um, there's seven different weapons that are listed in that passage. The last one that's mentioned uh, doesn't have a metaphor attached to it, like a shield or a spear or a helmet or anything like that. It's just mentioned by itself, but then it's mentioned four times. I mean, Paul repeats himself on this, uh, and it's pray. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of requests. And with this in mind, be alert and keep on praying for all the saints. Uh, it seems like the heart of this passage is to pray with the full awareness that the deck is stacked against you, that there's a spiritual dynamic that is at work in the world, uh, in my church, in my life that I need help. I cannot do this on my own. I cannot live the Christian life on my own. And so prayer becomes the bottom line weapon for uh, fighting spiritual warfare. What is prayer? Well, prayer is an acknowledgement that I can't do it myself. It is a surrender of my life to Christ. It is calling on him to fight for me and to fight with me and through me in this. And so, so prayer is an appropriation of this theme that we have in the Old Testament of God, of Yahweh as a divine warrior, ready to fight on behalf of his people and calling him to fight for me, to fight for me, for our corporate group uh, of believers. So, First and foremost, that's what I would say is spiritual warfare. 
Uh, the other things that are mentioned there are so important, and we go through each one one by one, but they are uh, equally important. And I think the hermeneutical key in interpreting them is to read what chapters one through five in Ephesians have to say about each of those weapons, um, truth, salvation, and so on. That's great. Well, yeah, you started with saying as you first started your relationship with God, you wanted to get into the word and Ephesians was one of the places that you went and Ephesians is, it's a, there's so much wisdom, there's so much um, knowledge, there's such a beautiful picture of Jesus and what he's done for us. We could keep talking for a long time, but uh, what we want to take away from this conversation is that there is a spiritual battle, but we are equipped to stand firm if we are walking in a relationship with Jesus and prayer and understanding letters like Ephesians will help us in that battle, but it's a battle that Jesus has won and uh, we get to Amen. walk with him in victory. So. Yeah. Dr. Arnold, I'm so thankful for a chance to uh, sit with you and ask you some of these questions, get insight into the letter, a little bit of your personal story, and some uh, practical encouragement on how to face the battle and discern the battle around us today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great to be with you, and I pray the Lord's blessing on you and your family and your church. Thank you.